Hey, good morning and welcome. This is our first virtually connecting session from Open Ed in Niagara Falls on the US side. So we'll start with on-site folks and then we'll introduce, uh, allow the uh, virtual folks to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Nate Angel from Hypothesis and I'm the virtually connecting on-site buddy here. And I wanna invite, uh, there's actually several other virtual connecting folks in the room as well. Um, but in front of the camera here, I'd like to have our on-site guests uh, introduce themselves, starting with MJ and then Tutulani and then um, and then Hong Ta. Hi, I'm MJ Bishop. I direct the Kerwin Center for Academic Innovation at the University System of Maryland. Hi, I'm Tutulani Asino, and I'm an assistant professor at Oklahoma State University, and I direct the Emerging Research in Technology and Creativity Lab. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Hong Tao Tao, currently teaching in the University of West Georgia. Great, and there are other BC people hiding in the room, but I think they're going to stay off camera. Well, hi to all the other VC people in the room. We're really, really excited to have this happening with Open Ed. Um, we've been watching the tweets from afar and uh, seeing some really interesting conversations starting already. Um, MJ, why don't we start with you and, and you can talk about how, how you Helen, feel. Helen, are we going to do virtual introductions? <laughs> Sorry about that. Yes, virtual introductions. <laughs> okay, I'll start since I'm unmuted and then leave you guys to introduce yourself. Um, I'm Mahabeli. I'm in the car in Cairo, getting back from the American University in Cairo to my house. But it's a long commute, so it allows me to talk to you guys, which is good. And I'm the co-founder of Virtually Connecting. Just I'm so happy to be with you both. <laughs> Thank you, Maha. Uh, let's go Jess, uh, Laura, and then Sarah. Hello, Jess O'Reilly here from the Cambrian College Innovation Hub, experiencing incredible FOMO that we are not joining you at Open Ed this year, but uh, so grateful for the opportunity to connect with you virtually. Laura, are you there? Are you there? Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm hoping the audio is coming through okay. Laura Killam, Innovation Champion, also in the hub. And I am live streaming you in our hub main space. So anybody that walks by can see. We'll see how. If I change locations in the middle of this, it's because of technical difficulties. That's awesome. And Sarah. Hi, everyone. Uh, instructional designer here at Cambrian College. I work with Jess and Laura, and I'm excited to learn what this is all about. It's good to have Sarah, her very first virtually connecting session. So that's awesome. Uh, OK, let's go back to on site and let's hear what's going on at the conference. Uh, first thoughts, um, upcoming events that you want to talk about? OK. Go for it. Go for it. Well, yeah. let me opt, opt to start and then let you guys uh, kick in. Um, so uh, we just heard two amazing keynotes. I assume that was also streamed for you all. Um, you know, I, I, well, Kent's just amazing. And, you know, it, it's, it's, I think I'm so excited about the, the leadership of the Hewlett Foundation and the direction they're taking things. Um, not just because we just got a Hewlett grant from my, my uh, Maryland Open Source Textbook Initiative, but also because I just, I think, and I'm going to talk a bit about this when I do my keynote on Friday, that um, it is time to shift gears a bit, that, um, you know, we've, 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 we've made progress, there are things, amazing things happening, but um, there's, there's a reality now that many of us are starting to face, particularly those of us at uh, state, trying to run statewide initiatives, that um, this is going to be hard work um, and that we're asking our higher ed institutions to take on an awful lot of uh, cost, an awful lot of, of you know, effort in terms of, of adopting OERs, you know, vetting them for accessibility for all the things that Jess was talking about in her keynote, um, and then maintaining them over time. And we're going to need to really begin thinking about what this looks like boots on the ground. So I'm excited about the Hewlett Foundation's change in direction, um, and I am completely on board with the things that Jess was talking about. I think that that falls on, on all of us, but particularly on our higher ed institutions to utilize OERs 
not just in the same way we've always used textbooks in the past, but to really capitalize on the affordances to um, to to create really continuous quality improvement and to to create learning environments that do in fact address all learners' needs. I saw some tweets about um, bringing the student voice and whose whose voices are not being included. Is yeah. that part of the the issues that you feel? coming up for you yeah, and, and understanding well I, I come at everything from an instructional design perspective there are a couple of instructional designers on the call today you know we need to begin with understanding who our learners are and from that then adjust our instructional materials accordingly open and the fact that these things are openly licensed allows us to do that but our internal processes at our institutions don't make that possible. So how are we going to capitalize on these affordances to do the kinds of things that, that Jess and Kent were talking about in their talks today? I think for me, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about the shifting of the conversation. I think in a lot of ways, OER, um, the open community started off with being focused on cost issue around textbooks mm -hmm. and so on. And I think for me, the um, Jess keynote really touch uh, a nerve in me because those are the issues that I end up wrestling with this idea of who else is involved in the conversation. Um, I think the cost issue and adopting of textbook and everything else I thought was a difficult conversation, but that's probably going to be the easiest of conversation right. because now who are you bringing into the com into the dialogue? Um, for me, because of the work I do in indigenous knowledge, I think that's that's a really important um, issue. Uh, when Jess was talking about line, I tweeted a picture out of, of, of the Scramble for Africa map. I mean, there's no place where that drawing of line has been very, very visible because you have all these different lines drawn for countries um, mm -hmm. by people who have no idea what the cultures were and the people who are living within those lines have no say in it. So for me, that's sort of really drove home the idea of why this is important because um, there's a lot of people in communities who are learning science that does not include their indigenous knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people who are, who are learning about books that, that do not recognize uh, you know, who they are. Um, I like to give an example of always, I was at, at home in Namibia where in a science classroom and the book was talking about snow and all these kind mm -hmm. of stuff. And I'm yeah. like, well, it's great that you know about snow, but in my village, I, we're not gonna get snow. So we might wanna try to have a book that actually has something about uh, how we understand science, how we make sense of it. So for me, I feel like we're moving into that space um, about inclusivity, um, but it's more than just opening up in that space. It's also about people who are in those communities actually having a say in the dialogue. Mm -hmm. Because it's, yeah, I can go into a conference and talk about, um, it's an example here, women issues, but I'm not a woman. Wouldn't it be nice if you actually had a woman talk about women issues? Same thing, I think, if you are talking about indigenous issues, wouldn't it be nice if you had um, somebody from those communities to talk about? And I think that's where we're moving in that direction, those representation, not just for lip service, but actually expanding the, uh, the conversation. And, for me, I, that's sort of what I'm very excited about. And I'm seeing a lot of those sessions sort of uh, spread around the conference. Just to, uh, this is a small plug, but <laughs> so we're gonna have uh, multiple virtually connecting sessions this week and we will have a session both with Jess tomorrow and then also with Kent's colleague, Angela DeBarger, um, who could probably speak to some of those um, Hewlett uh, things, which is also tomorrow, yes. Also said they're, they've recorded the keynotes and we'll post them on the oh. conference website. Good. So open it conference website. Good. We can't hear Ken speaking behind the camera of thoughts, Ken. <laughs> that was Terry. I was just saying they're going to post the keynotes recording on the conference website soon, they say. So you will be able to see Awesome. Them. Terry, if you have the links, we could post them on the virtually connecting website right away. I'll look. It's faster. <laughs> And uh, full disclosure, Hank Tao and I went to Penn State together. He was in the hallway, and I just said, hey, come with me to the room. No, he has no idea what he was getting into. So, so it's a sudden surprise. Yeah. So it's a very big yeah. surprise for him. Just so you know, you're going to be a YouTube star after this, yeah. forever and ever. <laughs> so th this is your first virtually connecting. Welcome. Thank you. So, so, so yeah, I would like to briefly share some of my you know, personal experience 
added like seven how uh, when we attending the uh, uh, the, the volcano of speech. I think uh, you you cannot have this kind of you know actual expand here, but uh, you know it's a uh, I feel like uh, when they delivering the kind of speech, it's kind of really silent. In the, the atmosphere is really silent. I think people are kind of you know reflect what they are talking about. I really enjoy the inspiring questions they post there, and also uh, I think they inspire people to post a lot of stuff on the Twitter. I joined them the conversation. I really enjoyed the, the talk, and also like uh, uh, the biggest uh, uh, the biggest uh, uh, experience for me is like uh, it bring me to think about the initial aspiration for we to use open education resources and why we started this kind of the open education movements. So in, I'm originally from China. We have that kind of Chinese old saying, like a, uh, not old saying, a recent saying, <laughs> so it's famous. So never change the initial uh, aspiration. So I, I think I can use here to quote my uh, reflection from the keynote speech. It's like uh, how we reframe our movements. It's like a, to be more inclusive, be more, uh, like uh, uh, Jess said, the diversity is a number. Uh, inclusion is a, is a, is a what? Process. Process, yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. And also uh, the equity is a, an outcome. So I think that aligned with our initial goal to, to use the open educational resources into the education. So, I mean, it's really inspiring. I really enjoy it. So it at any point, virtual folks can jump in and ask a question. Um, I'm just going to go back to the the issue or the the topic about drawing the lines. The um, where where are the lines being drawn? And and you talked about to the context in Africa. Um, do you see where the boundaries will be uh, unbound or opened in any way? Um, is that something that you? I said, is there potential there? For me personally, I think there is. Um, I think the, the the issue that I see is that often we're not aware of what other people are doing. So um, as again, as, as an African, I'm used to people saying that Africa is not producing, for example, scholarship. Now, for anybody who is familiar with Africa, we know that that's not true. Um, you can just go to Maha's website and be able to see <laughs> that that's not true. <laughs> so there's people producing. Um, and I think there's a lot of um, things happening around the open space, just globally. But I don't think we are in conversation with each other. Um, and I think that was, for me, a big thing around the keynote. And I think those are, I'm hoping those are the conversations that happen throughout the next few days. Um, so I think the some of the lines that we see are not really there i think are our perceptions um, but there are also definitely a lot of lines that need to be um to be to, to be removed speaking of lines and african scholarship I, I got a very strange tweet the other day someone tagged me and laura chernovich on this tweet which is this i don't know who what organization is saying african scholars write about your scientific research here and i was like what anything anybody just africa like that, that that is too open to be meaningful yeah. you know so there's a way to be inclusive in a meaningful and and respectful way and there's a way to be open in a way that's like i don't care who you are what you do just send it in which isn't very welcoming it's yeah. almost like <laughs> how do you feel about that i'll send you that tweet to the lady. yeah it it was like the um last week uh, there was uh, something on CNN about Kanye West going to Africa to finish his album. It's like, where in Africa exactly are we talking about? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> like, that you're talking about this Africa thing that has 54 countries. So. Downtown. Yeah, downtown Africa, <laughs> maybe. So. <laughs> so. Yeah, what's the capital? Of yeah, I, I, don't know. I don't know. I would like to find out myself. <laughs> Kind of, kind of like downtown Canada. Yes. <laughs> Somewhere in the space. I'm curious, MJ, when you think about this, like, I mean, that metaphor of the lines in Africa is a really tangible, obvious way that lines were drawn and could maybe be redrawn. Nick, can you come closer to the mic? Oh, sorry. I was standing way in the back. So I guess I'm, I was challenging MJ to think um, 
if you know the the Africa example are really tangible lines that have been drawn um, across a map without the participation of the people who have to live with them in most cases, right? Um, what are the lines that you might see in your work that are inscribed? They may not be physical map lines, right? That maybe need to, can be or could be broken down by open education. Wow, I'm putting um, you on the spot. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, that's all right. Um, it's a good question. Uh, you know, so so in in Maryland, uh, so the university system in Maryland is made up of twelve very diverse public higher ed institutions. Um, a lot of state systems um, in other places, you know, the, the CSU system, they're all kind of similar kinds of institutions that make up that system. For us, we've got three research intensive institutions, but then three HBCUs. We've got one entirely online institution. We've got the balance, our regional comprehensives that are urban, suburban, mountains, beach, you know, we, we kind of kind of have it all. And, and uh, you know, one of the lines that has concerned me from the time I started at the system is the, the resource line, right? So, you know, you look at the distribution of funds in our state to those public higher ed institutions, and, you know, the, the least I would say, I, I don't, don't quote me on this, um, but the least uh, of the resources are, are going to our HBCUs or to, you know, Frostburg, which is way out in, and some of that's because of enrollments, right? Some of that is, is because those institutions um, actually are at this point serving fewer students. But at the same time, unfortunately, that creates a lot of difficulties for them when we're talking about improving instruction, reaching students, um, technologies, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, so, you know, I think that's a line that open can help serve, but only if or that, that it can help uh, eliminate those lines. But only if we're, we're willing to really work together and to collaborate on these things. Um, I'm really excited about the direction that our Maryland Open Source Textbook Initiative most is taking. Um, we, we are working really hard, not just with our public four-year higher ed institutions, but also our community colleges, which aren't part of the system, to find ways to, to work together on these, these topics, to, to collaborate on the use of resources, to get Allegheny College, which is the feeder school for Frostburg, talking about, you know, what resources are we going to be using and, and sharing across the two year, four year to strengthen pathways and so forth. That's the only way I think right. that in my reality, those kinds of lines can be erased. Well, there is that boundary of the even the two year, four year boundary right. that's so inscribed <laughs> in American higher education or U.S. higher education. Yeah. And it's breaking down a little bit. Yeah. Right. A full, well, a full two thirds of our students are coming from they're transfer students. So they're a third are coming from community colleges, a third are coming from elsewhere. So we really need to enhance this conversation. And I think open OER is one way, I, you know, I, I look at a lot of these um, uh, technologies, if you will, as uh, ways to get, uh, you know, to hide the broccoli and the mashed potatoes, if you will, you know, this is, we start the conversation with OER because everybody's excited about saving students money, but then it becomes a conversation about pathways from two year to four year and that kind of thing. So so I do think OER can help to erase some of those kinds of lines. That was a very long answer to your question. No, it was interesting. I mean, I'm just, I think a lot about the invisible lines, right, yeah. that we don't see. What yeah. about in, in the Chinese context that you probably know better than us? Are there, are there lines there that need to be redrawn? Uh, yeah, I think that there are some of the uh, issues like the, the, the gaps between different kind of areas due to the economical uh, situations. So I think, uh, um, the one good thing for us is like uh, we have standardized the test all through the the whole series of education, but that's also one of the uh, one of the question one one of the areas that uh, draw the questions. So like uh, the kind of said that uh, uh, the more we get from the standardized test, <laughs> the less we can you know learn from our learners and know about our learners. So I think uh, for the uh, for the you know the the invisible line in China, I, I, and they also never called me, <laughs> I just feel uh, we can maybe use the OER to provide more personalized, you know, personalized and personalized instruction to, to uh, fill the gap of the diversity or the personalization. So mm -hmm. that's kind of from my perspective as well. So. How are our virtual folks doing, Helen? Yeah. Actually, we're doing fine. Um, 
just looking at boundaries between universities and colleges, because that's an issue that uh, comes up here in the Ontario context anyway. Do you see the, the boundaries, um, the breaking down between those two in any way, MJ? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think partially because uh, the four-year institutions are beginning to realize how much they need to rely on the community colleges, uh, given the fact that so many students are choosing that as an option um, to go through the two-year and get their associates first. Um, I think, you know, in addition to, to open being a place we can have this conversation, I think we're also beginning to have it around alternative credentials. You know, so micro credentials, badging, those kinds of things are places where, you know, now we can talk about, and of course, cyber is big where we are, cyber security, um, you know, DC area, lots of jobs there for that. Um, you know, so, so we have a lot of the community colleges creating, um, you know, certificate programs largely now, but I can see it moving into stackable, stackable credentials and badges that then on the four-year side, I think we need to begin thinking about, all right, so once once Nate has amassed all these stackable credentials, what's left for him to do in order for him to, to receive the bachelor's degree or, you know, what, what additional things would we want to, to, but, you know, that's going to open up a whole conversation about competency-based approaches and everything else. We're, we're having huge conversations in Maryland about articulation in that way and trying to create the platforms to make that easier. And I think that's something that's just starting here in Ontario as well through uh, some of the e-campus um, research that's been going on, the kind of sandbox spaces where they're playing. Yeah. The other piece that that really piqued my interest, uh, and maybe all three of you can talk about the the you talk about OER as resource, but you don't talk about people as resource. And I know that came up a little bit, a couple of tweets from Jess's keynote around being conscious of the time and energy that people take to create those resources. And is that being factored into any of your institutions in terms of the funding dollars? That's a very good question. Uh, and I, for me, I think it's part of, just thinking back even, um, if you look at any theories that study innovations, we usually don't study innovation in terms of people. We think of innovation as ideas, tools, and things like this, but we don't really think about people in terms of an innovation. And without people, you really innovations are useless. So that's a really good point. That um, where is the um, that sort of, for lack of a better word, that human connection to all of this? Um, and I, I don't know. I think uh, a lot of universities are starting to fund initiatives for faculty and staff and so on. Um, but I still think a lot of that is still putting the emphasis on that thing, whatever that thing is, uh, whether it's a tool or an idea or something, there's not really that, I don't see that as much. Um, and I don't know how to, to, to move from that. So I guess my question, my answer is that I, I don't know. I don't have an answer <laughs> for that one. So. so I'm not sure if I have an answer necessarily, but I've been giving a lot of thought in particular to incentivizing faculty and you know getting getting them engaged in this creation work because as we all know there's still a, still an awful lot of many many gaps in what's available in OER at this moment um, I think you know what we need is a quality review system uh, that allows for peer review um, if we can couple that with the ability to actually track OER usage so that, um, much like a faculty member who, you know, we, we turn to the citations index for our scholarship. Um, if we could have a citations index, so to speak, for OER, I'm then able to say, you know, so I created this amazing simulation. I made it openly licensed and 15 research one institutions have adopted it. 40,000 students have used it and it's moved the needle in this way in terms of student learning outcomes. That's huge i mean you know that's that's way down the road but you know i think so so i think we have to move away as a higher ed the academy needs to move away as much as we can just because the resources aren't there from incentives being in the form of monetary support and instead thinking about incentives being offered in terms of you know, professional development, movement in a career, those kinds of things. Because the, 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 the funds aren't there 
to, to provide the, the, the monetary resources to make it happen. But I think it shifts the conversations around um, academic um, credentials yes. for, for scholars and saying, you know, you've only been published in so many papers, but you've well, been recognized in publishing openly in yeah, and, these and, spaces. You know, We've always struggled with, so, so you know, there's the, the scholarship teaching service. We've always struggled with, you know, scholarship is fairly easy to measure. The teaching part has always been very difficult for us to measure in higher education. You know, we do course evaluations and things like that. But, you know, to be able to, to kind of go back to our roots and say, okay, my research contributes to the things that I teach. And here's the manifestation of that, right? My research has now contributed to this simulation I created and made open and is being adopted and disseminated broadly. That's that's cool. That's that's to me what this is supposed to be all about. And then it's service too. And then it's service too. And potentially some of that micro credentialing that you talked about for the students could could be applicable to the to faculty and scholarship as well. Oh yeah, yeah. I wonder if I can follow up on that because you started earlier saying that we're asking a lot of more of, of teachers to mm -hmm. do because a lot of what you're describing will require additional stuff. So from instructional designers, exactly. libraries, yeah. So mm -hmm. um, I think you have a much uh, better view given your role to be able to kind of look at that broadly. How does that look like in terms of to make the gains that we need? There needs to be a lot of buying from the faculty. Huge and culture staff shift. And Huge culture shift. Um, it, it's funny. I um, um, I've been um, referencing Herb Simon's quote about you know if we're going to make I'm not going to get it exactly right, but you know if we're going to make progress in higher education, it's going to have to move from a solo activity to a team sport. You know that that we've got to get faculty to recognize that my value as a faculty member isn't just in what I stand up and lecture about at the beginning, of, you know, or in every, every class, but rather my value is the extent to which I've contributed that subject matter expert and in any way that I, I can do it. And that frankly, in order for me to do it effectively, I'm gonna need help from instructional designers, libraries, those kinds of things. I, I don't have that answer. Now I'm gonna say, <laughs> now I'm gonna say I don't have that answer. But you know, I think that continuing the conversations, helping faculty, helping to reward faculty in other ways beyond just how many courses did I teach this semester will be, you know, those kinds of things will all help to move the conversation. I'm hoping. I do want to be conscious. I know you guys probably want to yeah. get back to the conference and there's all sorts of fun things. So I wonder if we should, Helen, if we should wrap it up unless there's something else on the virtual side. Absolutely. Yes. We're very conscious of taking time away from the uh, the work of attending the conference. Uh, Jess, Laura, or Sarah, any final thoughts before we uh, let these guys head on their way? I'd just like to say thank you for taking a few minutes out of your conference day to share your thoughts with us. And uh, uh, you've really made me want to find and listen to uh, Jess's keynote. So I'll, I'll, I'll keep my eye out for that. And uh, I hope you have a lovely conference experience. Also looking forward to your keynote. So um, yeah, I'll, I will, uh, I'll stay tuned throughout I'm, the few days. I'm looking forward to it too. I'm, <laughs> I'm waiting to figure out what the title is going to be. <laughs> Hard act for follow, right? Yeah, right, Hard right. Act. Yeah. And then there's the kiddo, yeah, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, sorry you all couldn't be here, but so glad you're able to connect this way. This is very cool. Yes, thank you so much for taking time. Thanks, Thanks, Nate, for all the setup that you've done. And now that it's set up, we're good to go for the rest of the conference. We have a number of other sessions coming up. So those who have missed this one or missed the first keynote, there is lots more yet to come from Open Ed. So stay, stay tuned. tuned. Yes. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.